Hi. All right, let me back up. Through. There we go. Okay. So uh, my name is Rob Pike. I was uh, at Bell Labs for many years, and then um, I've been at Google for roughly as long. And uh, although often credited with the creation of Google, it's a uh, sorry, creation of Google. <laughs> never, never credited with that. Often credited with the creation of Unix, but absolutely not. I, I was a fanboy, and I joined well into its development. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and every Unix history talk has this slide in it, which is Ken and Dennis at a PDP 1145. My guess is 1974 or thereabouts. But this is my personal story. I apologize for that. But I'd like to start a little bit earlier and uh, tell, me, tell you all a little bit more about what was going on back in the day. Um, back in the day, which we're talking like 1960s, um, this is what computing looked like. How many of you have ever seen a Hollerith punch card before? How many of you ever touched one? A few. <laughs> Hand, hand them around. Here's your chance. Uh, these were what, uh, these are the things that I learned to program on as a high school student. There was a thing at the University of Toronto where you could go and use the IBM 360, which I'll show you in a second, and you did, you did all the programming with punch cards, of course, nowhere near the computer. Punch cards uh, worked like this. Uh, they're still around, although you don't see them so often anymore, which is kind of a shame because they are the best note-taking paper available. Uh, and there's always a lot of broken ones. Um, you can write on the backup. So you see the columns are these are they're 12, 12 holes high, two off the top, and then 10 through the bottom. This is a partial encoding of, of a 64-bit character set, a subset of what's called EBCDIC, which predated ASCII. Uh, and you basically loaded them up into the hopper on the right of this thing, which was a Unix. Oh, uh, sorry, oh, I gotta do that a lot. IBM 029 key punch. They come down the bottom. You type. They go across, I can do this. You load them up here, they drop down here. As you type, they go across, and then when, the, when you hit column 80, it pops up to here. This machine and the cards that you're passing around now are why code is 80 characters wide and it's totally stupid. Um, <laughs> we don't use these anymore, why do we care? But uh, the, there's interesting things about these. For instance, every time you make a typing mistake, you have to throw the card away and go again, which is why they made such great note paper. They were everywhere. Um, and when you want to make, make a correction, you have to find the card that's wrong, fix it, replace it, whatever. Not a very productive way to compute, but a lot got done. Now, um, this is the core memory. And I've got one here, for those of you who've never seen one. This is from the KDF-9 at the University of Sydney some years ago. There were, it's an English machine. Um, this thing has 16 48-bit words of memory. It's a little bit less than you uh, have in your pocket right now, I suspect. <laughs> um, and they worked very well. They were actually a bit of a breakthrough because prior storage was either much more sequential or much slower. This gave you reasonable speed. It was like 10 microsecond response, which was great in the uh, sort of 60s era. And uh, it was random access, which is really cool. If you dig in a bit, you can see there's three wires going through every core. And the physicist I used to be could have explained how that worked, but I've mostly forgotten, except you have to do, it has to do with flipping the domains inside the ferromagnetic coils. But they were called cores because they were magnetic cores, little toroids. And you read them by putting a little bit of current through, and you wrote them by putting more current through. And uh, they worked great. They were not as reliable as memory today. Um, and I just noticed this is probably not as reliable as it used to be. <laughs> but anyway. Um, this is the machines that you had cores in. This was an IBM 360. This was the first significant computer I ever worked on. Again, at the University of Toronto. They had a thing called the high-speed job stream where you were allowed up to 2,000 cards of input, 2,000 lines of output, and three seconds of compiling go time, unless you're using Lisp, where you got five seconds. And for some reason, it was freely available. So I learned to program by, by well, learned to begin programming by hanging out in the computer center and using the high-speed job stream, which this is not a photo of. But this is a photo of an IBM 360. You can see there's the CPU there, some disk drives, some tape drives in the back, the obligatory sexist figure in the background. Um, uh, this is a card sorter, I think, back there. I'm not sure, though. Uh, this is probably the printer off here uh, and, of course, the console, because you have to sit and work at it. But mostly this was used for batch processing using cards, although there later was a time showing option, which we'll see a little bit later, called TSO, which was horrible. Um, now. You could do interesting things with IBM 360s and mainframes of that era. And I was a student in the 70s, and we had a very nice IBM 360 
168, I think, roughly comparable to a VAX, if you know what that is. So roughly one megahertz machine. This is a program I wrote in, during the off time of my first year of university, which was the only year I took any computing. And this has nothing to do with my computing course, except it was written in a language called PLC, which was a variant of PL1, which was the main IBM language at the time. And this is a program, this is a printout, the actual printout of my program, and apparently I found a bug here. Uh, what I was doing was ray tracing, which is to say not what you think of as ray tracing, making figures, but looking at ray bundles traveling through lenses, because I wanted to design lenses and other optical systems. And you know, you ran the program and you got this kind of output. This was done on the high-speed job stream, because even as a student, I had access to that, and it was free. Um, compile time, 0.18 seconds. Remember, this is a one megahertz machine. Runtime, 0.11 seconds. I have been waiting to get back to that speed of compile my entire career. <laughs> The 360, the stuff they had for doing high-speed work on the 360 has, I, in my opinion, unparalleled ever since. You can, people say a lot of things about the 360, but they knew how to make compilers run fast. So um, what this, why this is particularly relevant is if you go back here, you can see it's dated March 29th, 1975. That is the second semester of my first year of university. I took one computer course with a professor named Ron Becker. And the thing is, I can only do three seconds compile and go, and I want to do much bigger work, but I couldn't do that on the free stream. I needed an account, because back then you needed a computer account in order to spend the money to use the resources. So I went to my professor, and I said, hi, you know me, I'm the you know, annoying kid in the back. Um, do you have any free account money? That I, I, have, I showed him this program, I showed him what it was doing, I said, I'd like to do more. And he said, actually, my graduate student's account has extra money in it, you're allowed to drain it, I forget what it was, but we're talking like 100 bucks. But that's enough for, for a kid doing fun things to do. And so I, I spent some more months of evenings developing this program, and I turned it into a sort of graphical thing. For reasons lost to history, I decided I need to do an algol. So I learned algol, wrote this race tracing program over from scratch, but this time I made it graphic so that you'd have a printout on the fanfold paper where you could see the rays going through like this, right? So in about May, a couple months after this, I went back to Professor Becker's office, and I said, hey, here's what I did with the money you gave me. Look, and I opened up the fan phone, and, and you could see the, you could, it's like a flip book showing the animation. <laughs> and he said, that's really cool, come with me. And he took me downstairs into this room. Now this room is the, this, is, this photograph's from about three or four years later, but this room is the first Unix machine I ever saw. It is, it, I didn't know it was there, I didn't know what Unix was, but this was the computer graphics lab at the University of Toronto, a thing called the Dynamic Graphics Project, and there's a lot of cool stuff in here. This is Tom Horsley, I don't know where he is anymore, which is a shame. That's a PDP-11, 45, right there, just like the one you saw in the picture of Ken and Dennis. This is a GT40, which is a digital equipment brand display, whose main strength was it had kind of a cool editor, and also a lunar landing simulator, which everyone knew the address to hack more fuel in. Um, <laughs> That's a tape drive. I think the next picture shows a little better. Yeah, there's the machine. There's the PDP-1145, a couple of disk racks, tape drives, uh, GT40. This is a machine called the Graphic Wonder. We'll have a lot to say about the Graphic Wonder later. It's a graphics display. This is the console called the Deck Writer. And then this little thing is off topic, but this was the first raster frame buffer I'd ever seen. From about, this is about, remember this picture is about four years later. Done by David Tenenhaus, who later became well known as a networking researcher at CMU. Uh, his master's thesis was to build a frame buffer. This frame buffer was 256 by 256 by 8 bits. So on an iPhone or a Pixel, it's a picture about this big. That is the complete address space of the PDP-11. That's how much, that's how hard it was to do graphics. Okay? Uh, these are not two telephones. This is one telephone and a dial-up modem. Okay. Well, inside that room was one of these. This was actually a much earlier model of the PDP-11, but this is the handbook. This is my handbook. You can see it up there on the table. Um, for the PDP-11, this is the, the machine I learned to program in C on. Um, not this one, but this, this, this class of machines. This has two tape drives from memory. This is probably the original PDP-11, or maybe in 1104, very, very early uh, version of it. it. By the time we got to the 45, it had become a much more powerful machine with floating point and double word access. Things like that. Double words, that's two 16-bit words, 32-bit arithmetic. Um, uh, here, for example, is a page out of that. This is the jump subroutine, jump subroutine instruction, which even in 1975 was a little bit novel. Uh, not, all, not all architectures were 
working at that level. There was a Burroughs machine from the late 60s that became the ball machine, and it was mostly because it had a frame pointer and a jump subroutine instruction. So this is, this is how all that Unix code that I grew up with made calls to everything in the libraries. And this is all you need to know in order to use it. And in fact, you could read the whole book in an evening and pretty much write assembly code from then on. Um, this thing, anybody know what this is? This is a, no, it's not a RAM, very much not a RAM. This is a ROM. This is a flip card for a thing called the DEC Unibus, which was the backplane that ran the entire PDP-11 architecture. 22 bits wide, if I remember right, um, probably count the pins. And what this is, is each line of this is a word of memory for a ROM. And if you want a one bit, you cut the diode. And I won't argue with you, I've been known to solder those and cut them somewhere else to fix a bug in a boot ROM. This, this, was, this was computing back when you could actually see the bits. It was cool. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, back to this. Uh, this machine here, that's the graphic wonder. That was an important machine because, hold on, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, this was graphic wonder. It was a graph, it was a uh, vector drawing display, not a raster. It didn't do this. It, it would turn the gun on, draw a line, turn the gun off, turn the gun on, draw another line. So it would actually draw, literally draw with light on the phosphor. And it was built by a company called Three Rivers. And it was absolute state of the art for computer graphics in 1975, which was exactly why one Ron Becker brought me down there because he wanted to say to me, you want to use that instead of fanful paper. And so I started to do this. So this was a C program. So we've gone from PLC to Algol, and now we're in C, where I stayed for the next, uh, let's say, many years. Um, and now we're tracing the actual ray bundles and lighting up phosphor on a CRT. This is a photograph made in a dark lab with the glowing graphic wonder in front of me. And I could animate, you know, in a sense, uh, not really animate, but sort of animate. Uh, and you can see how ray, ray bundles were traveling through a lens. You might actually recognize this shape. This is the shape you get near the edge of a camera frame when the lens is not perfect, which they never are. That's an off-axis astigmatism, and I was able to emulate it. Nothing groundbreaking, except that the translation from fanfold to here was very important in my career. Uh, I should talk about the disk it had. This is not the disk, but it's equivalent. <clears throat> this is a photo I found on the web. This is, a, uh, I think it's an RKO5 pack, which was the disk that we had. There's a single platter inside here. When you stuck it into the cartridge uh, slot, opened up, access the disk, you can take it out later to unmount it. Um, as I showed you before, the PDP-1145 had two of them. Um, one of them was sufficient for all the storage of the lab. Um, so that means like the 15 grad students, the professors, me, I was just hanging around having fun. Um, and this is a manual page for the RKO5 from the manual I brought. Uh, a single, it says RKO3 here, but they're essentially equivalent. Um, RKO5, 256 word blocks numbered 0 to 4871. That's 4,872 512-byte blocks, or 2.4 megabytes. And that was enough to run the entire lab. Now, when I came to Google, command line flags.o would have not have fit on an RKO5 pack. But that's another story. <laughs> um, some other pages from that manual, which I have up here. This is one I printed out in probably 79 uh, on that deck writer. Actually, I think it was a replacement deck writer, because I don't think the original one had upper and lower case. That was new. Only one of the terminals in that room I showed you had upper and lower case. Everything else was uppercase. Um, this is the page one, which just came when I opened the box. APB1 is a program written by Tom Duff, and I hacked it. I didn't know that. Uh, and it's got my writing on it. This is dated 79, right? 75. Oh, OK. So this is an early program I worked on, probably that first summer. Um, this is a nice example of the kind of stuff we were doing there. We were doing a lot of uh, graphics, actually kind of groundbreaking graphics work, and also some sound stuff. Guy Fedorko wrote a program called Radio that let us play, play the local FM radio stations, not really play them. They were just, it was just tuning a radio. But we could control it from the computers, so you didn't have to have that hassle of getting out of your chair to change the channel, which is, of course, worth writing a manual page about back then. All right, now, uh, there's, there's going to be a theme through here. This is the 1979, May 21st version of the ED manual, which is the Toronto version of ED. Now, notice it says ED is the standard text editor. As you all know, that's still true. <laughs> the thing about this that I want to stress, because I think a lot of people today don't appreciate this, for its time, ED was amazing. I used the editors on deck and on control data machines and on IBM machines and others. And let me tell you, ED was a breath of fresh air. 
compared to what I had to put up with on some of the other ones. So laugh at ED all you want, but I'll get me mad at you if you do, because it was the thing that started it all. I'll talk a little more about that later. Actually, it didn't quite start all, but it's the one you saw that started it all. Okay, other things that went on in that lab, which, which I worked on, I did a system called Kepler, which was an animation system for the planetarium in Toronto. Now, you think animation, you think, you know, ooh, movies flying on the screen. We did that, but of course it was done on a film plotter, one frame at a time and about 20 minutes to print a frame. So we'd make a movie it'd take all night to make a few seconds of film. And this is not a very interesting screen except for one fact on it. This is the sort of opening wake up screen for that system. There's some stuff here that I don't remember what it's about. There's some buttons down here that look a lot like a menu, which is not a coincidence. Down here, there's a little word that says, the scroller runs down here. That's because in 1977, I think, maybe 78, when this was written, I didn't know it, but I'd written a window system. I didn't know this yet because we hadn't invented the term. But I was running commands down here while other animations were running up here. This is a, a still sort of recreation of what the Graphic Wonder looked like using some library that emulated it. But the idea is still there. This was a, on the Graphic Wonder, this was a live window where you could type stuff and make things happen. And other stuff that went on in one amazing burst of about 48 hours nonstop, Bill Reeves, who's now one of the top tech people at Pixar and I, he was a student in the lab. We took the guts of that animation program and wrote this program, which was a thing for uh, doing scored music editing live on a screen, which was a remarkable thing to do back then. We did this because the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, CBC, was coming in to shoot a documentary about the future of music. Yehudi Menuhin was the host, and we wanted Yehudi Menuhin to be able to play music back through our synthesizer, and this let him do that. And of course, it dumped core as they were setting up the cameras, but we, Bill found the magic fix, and it ran for the demo, and he had never seen anything like that, because nobody had. This hadn't been done before. It was pretty cool. But eventually, all good things come to an end, and I graduated. This, is, uh, this was taken on the day I graduated <laughs> university. <laughs> and I went off to go to grad school in California. Now, when I went to grad school, I was a problem. I visited the grad school I was going to, and I knew they didn't have Unix. So I took one with me. I tucked an Archeo 5 pack. We had backups. I tucked a backup Archeo 5, full Unix distribution under my arm, because I knew they had a PDV 11, but it was running RT 11, which was a DEC system, and it was terrible. So I decided, why don't I bring Unix to see what I can do? Um, and we did a lot of stuff in the end. We ended up running a lot of the Voyager ground stations off that Unix system that originated on a disk very much like this. But the point of this story is, across the US border, there'd just been a sort of realization that software was important. So you weren't allowed to import software without a lot of attention. I got to the border, I had this bag with this in it, and the security guard, or the customs guard said, what's in the bag? And I said, oh, it's a computer disk. I'm not gonna lie. And he said, well, is it software? And I said, no, it's just computer programs. And he said, okay, you can go then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after grad school, and beca largely because of people I met at grad school, including Bart, who we'll talk about a little bit later, I got to work at Bell Labs Research starting in 1980, which was uh, a very important time in the growth of the computer center at Bell Labs, the Computer Research Center. Um, and it's been observed that the headquarters, which this is 600 Mountain Avenue, Murray Hill, New Jersey, looks a little bit like Darth Vader. And when you get inside, it's even scarier. Um, this is uh, floor four of building one. And that's really what the halls look like. These doors go into labs. Then, then it's kind of a long hard corridor. And then off the sides are wings that have the offices. But the labs are on the main hallway. And these walls are all metal, which is important because you can move them, but also important because when you get explosions, they tend to be contained. Bell Labs was interesting. Uh, we, lit, we literally had hot and, ho hot and cold running fluorine, oxygen, silane in the halls. We could do things there we can't do here. I kind of miss it sometimes. All right. Um, but it wasn't all scary. So just for a slight diversion, there's a thing. I, didn't, I brought a variant of this, which is up here. You can take a look at it later. There's a thing called Cardiac, which was a, uh, the Cardboard Instructional Aid to Computation, which is a cool little like toy simulation on cardboard made in the 60s by my dear and unfortunately late friend, Dave Hagelbarger, who was actually someone who worked hard with uh, Claude Shannon. So there's some connections there. And he designed this system where with using cardboard and punching out cardboard things, you could make effectively a little, uh, see here's the, here's the cards here. You could take, punch out these bugs here and put them in here and slide them up and down. And eventually, you know, sort of, here's the accumulators and registers and arithmetic. And you could learn how computers work. And pretty much that is what an ALU does modulo 
the electronics. And they handed out, I don't know how many, but certainly tens of thousands of these cardiacs to high school students uh, to teach them how to, how to, or what a program was anyway, and what computers were, because they were called electronic brains then by most people. They're still learning. Um, there were three versions of this. There's this one, there's the one I brought. This one, I've got a picture of I didn't bring because it's very precious. Um, but there was a later one called the information machine, which was much, much too flashy and less fun. But this was a charming little device. So not everything at Bell Labs was terrifying. Um, but there were aspects of it. Here's the instructions to tell you how to put it together. Some can, I, I tell you I can set up one of these faster than I can set up a Mac today. Um, but anyway, back to the story. So this is a, a photograph of a uh, Honeywell system from the late 60s, which was the system that Bell Labs was working with MIT on to construct, uh, adapt the system from GCOS to a new experimental very, very influential, it turns out, operating system called Multics, which was a real time sharing system back when time sharing was, was rare. It was certainly not unheard of, but it was rare. And the most famous example was IBM TSO, the time sharing option, which was just awful. Take you 20 minutes to log in. Um, but GCOS was a lot more interesting, and then Multics was actually going to be transformative. But guess what? The project ran way over. Uh, Dennis, Richie, Ken Thompson, people like that were working on it and they kind of got bored with the whole thing and it was taking too long to finish. So one day, Ken went upstairs and found a PDP-7 that was unused. This is not his PDP-7, but this is a PDP-7. It's an early precursor, you know, lab level machine. It's got deck tapes, it's got oscilloscope, a teletype and, and a computer and not much else. If I remember right, it's an 18-bit word. I think that's right. I think it's like the, it's related to a PDP-9, which I have programmed, but I've never actually seen a PDP-7. I suspect Ken's PDP-7 looked more like this one uh, in a lab on some kinds of junk in it. And he wrote a, a program called Space War, which lets you animate, you know, animate and fight, like pretend Space War stuff, a little bit like the lunar lander on the GT40. Everyone was obsessed with the space race back then. Remember, this is before the moon landing. Um, and uh, it caught on and then they decided to write an operating system for this machine and the room this was in eventually became called the Unix room. Although the Unix room moved downstairs, the name went with the idea. Um, and then of course eventually, by five years later, it's actually worth having a, a Bell Labs official PR photo. That's Ken before his beard. That's Dennis. That's the teletypes. Remember we're still using teletypes in a lot of these machines. Uh, that's the PDF-11-45, just like the one you saw in the dynamic graphics lab. These are uh, deck tapes up here. Deck tape was an interesting architecture we don't need to go into, but actually kind of clever. Uh, and again, notice what you see over here, two RKO5 packs. Probably RKO5, they might have been slightly bigger. But we didn't have a lot of disk. This is before I got there, but not too much. Okay, now I eventually arrived at Bell Labs Research. It was an incredible privilege to be hired by them. Um, I was interviewed by Dennis Ritchie, among others, was all very terrifying, but they liked me, I guess. Um, and I had uh, learned how to program on Unix, which is why I wanted to be there. I wanted to be with the people who made this happen. And of course, I'd already learned C. I'd actually bought this book, the C programming language, and I read it in one crazy night. I knew how to program in C a little bit already, but I read the book. I was actually sick in bed with food poisoning, and I devoured this thing. But when I got to Bell Labs, I got to do some interesting stuff with it. So this is from the original C book, probably not the one most of you have seen. There is the original Hello World as according to what most of the world saw. And that is a valid C program as of 1979, 1980. And for those of you who know C, you'll notice there's some stuff missing. For instance, there's no include of stud.io, but printf is there anyway. Okay, then uh, because I was at Bell Labs, I got them to sign it to me, which is nice. Uh, and then uh, in the mid 80s, they wrote this new version for draft proposed ANSI C. This is not the final version that you probably all know. This is the pre ANSI C final version, but it's got another version of Hello World, and now we have stud.io.h, but it's still not ANSI C. There's one important change happened for the final edition of this book. Anybody recognize it? You're missing int main void there. And when Ken saw that you had to put void in now between those parents, he made a famous remark, uh, which was basically, what? <laughs> Why do I have to put void there? But this time I was actually part of the story, which was fun. So now I got to help them out with that, which is kind of cool. All right, let's back up the clock a bit and talk about editors. Um, when I was at the University of Toronto, ED was a 
God sent for us. But the, the God, the guys in the lab, Tom Duff, Mike Tilson, Bill Reeves, uh, Greg Wilson, um, Tom Horsley, a bunch of us, I probably missed some names, which you said, uh, Dave Sherman, um, Sh Sheila Crossy, I won't remember them all. Anyway, um, they were using the system to do their research, but you know they were hackers, they wanted to hack. And so one of the first things you hacked was the first line of defense on your computer, which was the editor. So the editor went through a lot of changes. Now, ED was actually based on a prior sequence of editors called QED, which had originated in Berkeley in the 60s with Butler Lampson and, and Peter Deutsch. Ken Thompson worked on QED, or at least used it. And when he came to Bell Labs in the mid 60s, he pretty much either brought or recreated QED. I think he brought it, but I'm not sure. Um, so here we have a document dated August, I think, and my, yeah, it'd, be, it'd be US ter terminology, the 12th of August, 66, an obsolete manual about QED. However, that document was written by Ken Thompson in probably the largest single document he ever wrote. Uh, he wasn't a huge writer, just a programmer. But this is the manual for QED from 1966. And QED was very familiar, would, would feel familiar to people today, although quite different. It was a line editor and all the rest of it. But it had multiple buffers. It was more programmable. And uh, here's some interesting other QED documents. Brian Kernahan wrote a tutorial to QED. Remember, Brian's emerging here as a member of the lab working on things and specializing in explaining to the lesser mortals what the greater mortals have figured out. Um, but of course, uh, things got obsolete then too. 1967, it's already obsolete. We've already obsolete in 66. Now we're up to here. Uh, Brian writes another book. This one's dated 1970, but this one now is interesting because it's advanced use of the QED text editor. Remember, people are still using GCOS, which is down in the base, well, not the base, first floor. Um, but, but some of the others are upstairs with the PDP-7 and later PDP-11 having fun. Um, what's cool about this page for me is he says, you should probably already know what these commands do. And if you're a VI user, you probably know almost all those commands today. Some things never change, right? Uh, and then here, I like this one. This is 1974, but now TSO is caught up. There's now QED for TSO. So you can now use uh, TSO and QED, which is an interesting combination. Um, and what's cool about this page is down here, you see it says, this is addressed to Ken Thompson. His office is MH Mary Hill. 2C520, that means two, two, building two, wing C, room 523. Author specified you, it says. The author of this memo sent it to Ken so that he could know, or perhaps have reviewed, uh, that there was now QED on the TSO, which was probably not of much interest to him, because by then, V5 Unix is happening. And that's about when, this is a year before I started working in the DGP lab at Toronto, and we, we had V5, so although Ken denies it. He thinks we never had V5, I know he did. Um, I think we weren't supposed to. Um, what's interesting about QED, this is very important, is that QED, as done by Ken, not its predecessors, was the first use of regular expressions in computing. There was a theory by uh, Mr. Kleene, K-L-E-E-N-E, -E -E, about how to define regular languages with a notation he called regular expressions. And Ken Thompson, being the genius that he is, realized that you could apply that idea and actually make it work inside a, a text editor to let you find patterns and things like that. So he wrote this paper describing, this is 1968, he wrote a paper describing how he implemented QED for the 7090, which is another IBM machine, uh, and put the regular expressions inside it. And it, this is a fascinating paper because first of all, it's, it's seminal. It's the original appearance of regular expressions in computing as opposed to just theory, but also because the way it was implemented was by compiling on the fly into 7090 machine code to do the evaluation. And that was pretty interesting. So it's a fascinating paper, really interesting. Uh, but you need a 7090 cheat sheet, which, is, which I can get you if you want to read it. Um, and of course, eventually, it, QED was very massively complicated. It had multiple files, multiple buffers, uh, crazy programming capabilities. And when they went to do Unix, it was a smaller machine. I think Ken just said it's messy enough. So they stripped it down and just called it ED, made it a single file editor, but it's kept regular expressions and the fundamentals are the same in about how you edit. So this is the version seven ED page, which actually postdates the ED page I showed you from the University of Toronto before. Um, because that's this one, 1979. Remember, uh, this is about a year, well, probably almost, almost simultaneous actually with V7 Unix coming out. Um, this is the University of Toronto ED. And the University of Toronto ED was hacked like crazy and ended up going out on the Toronto software distribution tape where the University of Berkeley 
people borrowed all kinds of features. Lots of things you know about VI internals and how it works. Uh, original VI, not Vim. I don't know about Vim. But VI, a lot of it came from the work we'd done at the University of Toronto. Um, but we were stripped of our authorship rights because the regents of the University of California were afraid and said, or something happened anyway. And Bill Joy was told, you can't have copyrights for other people, other organizations. So all the Berkeley software distribution just says copyright regents of the University of California, but a large chunk of that software came from elsewhere, including the work that we did in Toronto. But anyway, that's ED. Now, what's what we did with ED was we were hacking ED, and eventually people said, leave ED alone. We would just want to use it. So uh, Tom Duff, Hugh Rettelmeyer, me, and Dave Tilbrook recreated QED for, uh, v, for V7 Unix. And I was, I was really happy. Later, when Dennis was writing up the history of QED, he said this was probably the nicest QED of all. So that made me very, very happy. This still runs. I have a working version of QED on my, on my machine here. Uh, it was written in relatively old C, but it wasn't too hard to update. And if, if those of you want to see what life was like when you could actually work one line at a time but get work done, I can show you how QED behaves. The thing that's important about this from my own history is that, as many of you probably know, I went on to write other editors like Sam and Acme and so on. All of those are multi-file editors. When I, wanted, when I got to, to um, Bell Labs and I wanted to sort of move on to the hot new thing, I tried VI. It only did one file at a time, no interest to me. You edit programs, you don't edit files. I tried Emacs, and it was harder to change buffers than to write a file from scratch. So I just wrote my own and used QED to write my own multi-file screen editor. But that's another story. OK, uh, this is a page I found when I was going through my archive this weekend. I have no idea what it's about, but this is all QED commands. And I think I was writing a memo or a description to somebody about how insane this editor was to use. That command I recognize. The rest I'm not so sure about. That says set buffer capital S to some string. And then that sets the truth flag to something, I don't know, craziness. But anyway, history, who knows? We forget. OK, let's get back to Unix itself. This is the, uh, wow, you really can't see the edge of the page there. Uh, this is just a page of the, the opening page of the seventh edition of the uh, Unix edition research, real original Unix. Came out January 1979. I have one up here you can take a look at. Um, when I was at Bell Labs, one of the first things I helped them with was build the eighth edition which was newer and better. Uh, most important things among it were some of the things I'll be talking about, but also much nicer shell, a lot of richer stuff. Uh, and it was fun to participate in making that happen. That came out in 1985. I suspect that date is the date we got the manuals, because I would have written it down on that day. But I'm not sure exactly. It says it's dated February. It's plausible we got them delivered in April. Um, then version 9 came out a couple of years after that. And version 10 which was probably the apotheosis of research Unix, it was a very, very nice system to use. But by then, most of us had lost interest in Unix and we're working on Plan 9. But I'm here to talk about Unix history, not Plan 9 history, so let's stick to Unix. OK, now, I wrote a book. Um, uh, around 1983, Brian Kernahan and Dennis Ritchie, who were down the hall from me, were having a heated discussion in the hallway because they had written this C book, which was very successful. And it has a huge part in, to play in the establishment of Unix around the world. But, uh, and Brian, who is really a writer most of all, wanted to write another book with Dennis because that was so successful. One called something about Unix and the Unix book, get the Unix book out there. And he was arguing with Dennis that Dennis was a great writer, which he is, was. Um, and, you know, we should help. And I heard them arguing. I was really upset because I wanted the book too. So I went back to my office and I sent out a long, passionate email to Dennis and Ken saying, sorry, Dennis and, and Brian saying, please, please write this book. It's really important. The world needs it. Here's all the reasons why. And Dennis came to my office and said, if you care that much, why don't you write it? So, so I did with Brian, <laughs> which was a fantastic and a really, really fun thing to do. We had a blast writing this book. It's full of in-jokes that almost nobody gets, but that makes them even better. Um, all of our friends are in it. Uh, if you see who, there's a lot of people here. And one of the things I did was I, when the book came out, I went around the lab and I got everybody who was in it to sign my copy of it. So there's John Bentley, Doug McElroy, the smartest person you've never heard of, uh, Ed Bradford. Um, we have Peter Weinberger, Googler, Gerard Holtzman, who's now at NASA. This is probably the best page. Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, together on one page. And uh, that book was 
hugely successful. It's still in print, although it doesn't sell all that many anymore. But it's amazing to me that a book that came out in late 1983 is still technically relevant today. It's insane. But that's how seminal the whole Unix idea was and how we still depend on everything it does. For those of you who don't really appreciate it, I'm sure you all know every machine in the data center is running a Unix variant anyway. The entire internet runs on Unix and it's popular worldwide. worldwide. Um, this is at Pebbly Beach. And I did not make this photo, but I'm so glad I have it. <laughs> I think it's an Eastern Gray. It's probably a wallaby. Probably a wallaby. Anybody know what kind of wallabies there are at Pebbly Beach? No? No, you're Australian. Why would you know? OK. <laughs> um, let's go back. Remember that, that graphic wonder? Did I skip one? No. Uh, the graphic wonder machine I showed you before, the graphics display. And then to the left of it, there was a raster display. We were all worrying about graphics back then because it was clearly the future and you know networking hadn't really caught on yet as an idea we all knew we needed it but we didn't know what to do and at Xerox Park they would built this thing which is called the Alto and the Alto dates from the late 70s um, there's a vertical screen which is interesting keyboard a mouse we're gonna talk a lot about mice in a minute what are these they're actually Diablo disk packs but they're almost identical to RKO5 disk packs that's the disk the disk uh, drive down there. You take the cartridges in and out. The actual Alto itself is down here. 70% of the, of the cycles of the microcontroller inside the Alto run the display. The rest are left to run the disk and, and let you compute. But it was an absolutely seminal machine. Um, Steve Jobs is often credited with being the genius who stole it. Um, I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I think that really doesn't give Xerox enough credit. This machine was amazing. Very, very slow, but absolutely world changing. Now, Everybody by about 1980 knew that the future was going to look like Xerox Park, but we didn't know exactly what it was going to look like. So let's go back to here. Here's the graphic wonder, right? University of Toronto, 19, this photo is 1979, but I first saw it about 75. And, but it's, it's vectors. It's not a raster to screen. And who, who can use a PDP 1145 as a personal computer? We needed something better. So that, sorry, the graphic wonder here was designed by a company called Three Rivers named after a part of Pittsburgh, I think, um, some ex-CMU people. And they built a brilliant raster, uh, sorry, vector graphics machine back in the 70s. And they decided they should get in the Alto lookalike business. So they built a thing called a Perk. And you can see it looks a lot like the Alto. Um, it's got a vertical screen, keyboard, I don't know where the mouse is. Um, and we were very excited this machine because you could get it. Rand Pascal uh, and one of the, uh, Tom Duff and Bill Reeves from University trying with me, we're now at Lucasfilm. And so uh, some of us from Bell Labs flew out to Lucasfilm to see the perks in action, which was, could basically be described as none. Um, they had no action. They were very uninteresting machines. The software was terrible. It had no power. Uh, it was very disappointing. Um, they were slow, they were buggy, but the real problem was the software was lacking imagination. And it was clear to us that we could do better, but we didn't know quite what we we're gonna do yet. Uh, and this was called Perk, which is a clever name, I guess. But the people at Lucasfilm relabeled re them jerk, J-E-R-Q, because they hated them and they ended up doing something else altogether. But this put a seed in our minds. And so we went back to <laughs> Bell Labs and it was Dave Ditzel, Greg Chesson, Bart Lacanti, and myself, I think, were the ones on that trip. And Ditzel came back and said, I'm going to build a machine like this. And he built a little toy. It wasn't very good. I think he made it wasn't very good. But it was enough that we could actually do some graphics programming. And I wrote this, this absolutely amazing game called Nuke the Smileys, which is probably the most obnoxious thing up until Flappy Bird. Um, <laughs> chances are your high score was like three um, because the things just came screaming out. But anyway, I just had to get a picture of Nuke the Smileys. In. Um, Bart designed this machine, which he called the Jerk. He asked the guys at Lucasfilm, is it OK? Can we steal your name? And they said, absolutely. If you can make a good Jerk, we want him. Uh, so Bart uh, and, and I, with help from a lot of other people, started talking hard about what we're going to do. And we had this idea to build a terminal, not a computer. We had a computer. We had these nice big, by now, Vaxes running Unix we were very happy with. What we wanted was a user interface to Unix. And I had realized, I think subconsciously, I still, when I say it today, I don't really know when the idea really happened. But I worked at the University of Toronto. I'd done multitasking on a screen. I knew that what this thing could do was give you the multitasking power of Unix with a user interface that actually exposed the multitasking. So Bart decided to build us the hardware, vertical screen, mouse, keyboard, all that stuff. Now, there's a worry here because we're going to talk about mice. Um, this is the thing. This is actually a blit, uh, a jerk, actually. 
same thing. Jerk and blade are the same, two different names. This is one, this is it. Uh, it's got 68,000, it's got uh, 256K of RAM, which 100K goes directly to the display. It just runs the display right out of the main RAM. These are the ROMs, uh, and it's got, it's all hand wired. Um, 2200 wires on there. Uh, this one looks like Bart wired it. We both wired them. He was always neater than I was, but the ones we did both, they always took a little debugging. But you can look at that later. That's a real, that's a honest to God, Blit board from 1982, probably, maybe 81. Um, there it is from the back. And you can see it's all very tidy. This, there were much bigger boards than this around. We had machines to help us do this, but honestly, you were doing this for days. Um, this is what it looked like properly built. Uh, notice the quality cabinetry. Uh, <laughs> it's a research lab, right? There weren't very many of these. I only built about six of them to start with. Uh, vertical screen. Keyboard, notice there is no mouse. We're gonna, remember that, we're gonna come back to the mouse story. You couldn't get mice, they didn't exist. We could only buy tablets, and tablets were terrible compared to what mice are and can be. But all we could get was a tablet, so there was a tablet, and this was the, the, what they looked like built up. Here's a, a photo of a screen. Uh, this is probably literally a photograph. I don't, I don't think it was uh, made any other way. This would have been done by the PR department. Uh, you can see we didn't have good fonts yet. This weird texturing was an, a later abandoned idea I had about how to show you which window was busy, which is this one, because it's not textured. I want to show you two things about this. Overlapping windows on a screen, talking to a Unix machine in 1982, probably, maybe late 81. Uh, doesn't, I don't think date is on there. Um, so here's B Bart is writing to me, or Bart is writing to himself, I think, from this window to this window, which is kind of cool. R70, that's because it's a PDP 1170 sending a message, right? Notice he's somewhere in DataKit. Um, we did not use Ethernet. We had a different network called DataKit. Ethernet hadn't really caught on yet. So we had early networking that was different from Ether. And in many ways, I think Ether was worse than what we had, but Ether got better. Um, anyway, that's the screen, and you can see we're doing stuff. Now, will this run? <laughs> Let's find out. There's no sound. In, in January 1982, oh, it's going to work. I went to Usenix which wasn't called Usenix yet, I think. Uh, and I gave a, a talk where I showed a video, about a five minute video, which is available on YouTube now. And I want to express to you that nobody had seen this before. Nobody had seen active overlapping windows because no one else had done it. And this was a confluence of all these different ideas coming together. So a little, the most important clip, I hope it'll play well enough you can see it. Uh, you probably can't tell, my mouth is moving, the ball is bouncing, that's two active windows. Everything frees when I make a window, but that's okay. And then the ball comes out the top. Now, dead silence, right? Who cares? This video was the most rapturous, rapturous reception of anything I've ever done in my technical career. <laughs> at the Usenix conference, the idea that you could have multiple things going on at once on the screen and manage them was astounding. And it's hard to express how cool that was, but I can remember. You don't have to believe me. Okay, can I get out of here? Yeah, okay, so here, now, this is a, a photo made by the uh, Bell Labs uh, PR department. This is the amazing, amazing genius, Luca Cardelli, uh, a good friend of mine from Bell Labs. Uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society now. He's too smart for us. Um, here he is holding the mouse in one of the canonical ways for PR photographs, one holds the mouse. <laughs> and you can see us both staring at a picture of Peter Weinberger. We did everything we could, we could to get Peter Weinberger into all the PR shots. Um, but now we have a mouse, right? So what's that about? Well, the problem was we didn't know where to get mice. And in early 81, Niklaus Wirt from ATIO in Zurich came to visit Dennis and give a talk about a machine he was building, which was, I think, the Lilith machine. I may have the name wrong. I think it was the Lilith, which was another, you know, perk, alto, that kind of thing machine. We're talking, remember, this is before the Mac, before Sun, before all those things. And uh, I gave him a demo of the better software running on the Nuke the Smileys machine. And uh, he was unimpressed because it was multi-process. He didn't want, he thought processes were a bad idea. He's a brilliant man, but he has a very peculiar ideas about something. And Dennis told me to lecture him, tell him why it matters that there are multiple processes inside the user interface. And, and we did, and I don't know if he, we convinced him, but we stayed friends and uh, we asked him, what do you do about mice? And he said, there's a professor in Lausanne at DPFL that makes them for me. 
And so I contacted, this is actually a little later, this is a company that they made, but in 82, they were actually commercially making mice. Um, so I wrote to Mr. Mr. Niku, Professor Niku in Lausanne, and he said, we'll get you some, no problem, they're about 350 bucks, that's fine. Uh, and after some difficulties, eventually we got them. And this is the first mice, this was the first mice mouse we ever had at Bell Labs, and it's one of the first in the world outside of the Xerox Orbit SRI. This was later retired. I spent so many years with this under my hand. Um, I was, when it was finally retired, I went back and I had him sign it. I think you can see that they, they took an engraving tool and they signed it to me. Because this was a very important device. This, this, this little machine changed my life. And have a look at that, but treat it with love. All right. Um, no, obviously this machine was interesting. The world cared about it, but we had to get out the, out the door. First thing we had to do according to management was change the name. We couldn't call it the jerk. So we, we called it Blit, which some people think means Bell, uh, what was it? Bell Labs Interactive Tomato or something. But no, it mean, it's the second part of BitBlit, which is the bitmap operator that we used to do all the graphics. And Bart wrote a memo describing the basic layout, how it all worked. And then the guys from Teletype, who were amazing in a different way, they came in and eventually made a product out of it. Uh, they changed the processor, which is a self a saga. Um, and they sold those product. It actually sold very, very well um, because it was the only thing you could get for main, mainframe Lux class machines. You can connect this up to an IBM mainframe, you connect it up to a Cray, you can do all kinds of things with it. Um, and again, here's another canonical way to show the mouse. Don't forget, people didn't really know what mice were. So if you, you wouldn't know there were buttons on it if it was the way around you'd really use it. Um, but this was, a, this was a glossy brochure they made. And you can see some utterly nonsense stuff going on here. There's a circuit design pretend thing. This is nice. Profit goes up and to the right. <laughs> <laughs> and it made the front page of the Bell Labs news. And uh, because I'm who I am, I wore a shirt that said jerk, but you can't really tell. It didn't say blit. Um, but I was really happy. We actually, front page of the Bell Labs news was a big deal for, for us. We were a little tiny organization and being important to the rest of the company mattered to me. But just to give you an idea how radical and weird this stuff was. But we're still before Sun Microsystems, before the Mac. Um, very few people have actually seen these things in the wild. I have mail from friends who got them and wrote back and said, oh my God, I've wanted this my whole life. Um, above the fold of this page of the Bell Labs News, oops, wrong, above the fold, this way, yeah, is this. Here we are, we're talking 1984. I guess that Apple has come out with Mac shortly before this. Um, here is another, here are more important because it's above the fold. Is a better mount for payphones, right? The world really wasn't quite ready for all this yet. They were still working on it. But on the other hand, new fiber set transmission records, that's the top story. Um, no, no talk that has anything to do with uh, the Blit can possibly avoid discussing Crab's The Bitmap Terror, Luca's greatest contribution to computing. Um, the deal with a, with a window system and a screen manager and all that stuff, which, which took some it's obvious, it's so obvious when I say it, it sounds stupid, but every program gets its own little box. And the idea is they're, they don't ruin each other, they don't step on each other. But Luca's not that nice. So Luca wrote a program called Crabs. He designed these little animations of little crabs. And the idea was they would run around on the background texture of the screen. Remember, it's one bit per pixel, so the background was a texture, it wasn't a solid color. And whenever they found something that wasn't that texture, they would take a bite out of it. <laughs> and put the texture down, and it would gradually erode your screen. And we get, now this, is, this picture here is actually what we call Lens. It's a, another program that looks up at this one. You can see the crabs coming out of here. That's, that's uh, Luca, that's Mark Manassa, uh, and their faces are on the screen, and they're being eaten by crabs. And if you let it run long enough, it starts to look like that. <laughs> and the little, these are called turds. That's when two crabs bite each other, and they leave behind a little patch. Now, this was really fun and cute, it's, it, and I think philosophically the important thing here was the idea that there was a rule about what a program should do, and it was clear that Krabs was not following the rule. But the important thing about Krabs was, of course, we put a flag into Krabs that lets you launch it into the future, and you'd always make sure that it started <laughs> mid-demo of somebody giving a talk. <laughs> and if they had no idea what Krabs was, they'd panic, 
precisely because the model had been violated. What are these things on my screen? What's going on? There, there was really creepy. It was fun. Anyway, <laughs> Luke went on to do much more important things, but I don't think he ever did anything more entertaining than Chris. So other things that went on at Bell Labs at the time, this is not the Bell Labs Cray, but this is a Cray. This is the Cray one. These would be the disk drives for the Cray. Uh, Cray one was an early 80s machine, state of the art, um, massively, massively powerful. There's nothing like it ever before. It's roughly as equivalent power to this thing. In fact, this is probably stronger. But at the time, that was an amazing beast. Fantastic I.O., incredible I.O. This has more I.O., if you count the graphics card anyway. And uh, we got a Cray at Bell Labs because they wanted to do an American simulation of semiconductor stuff. Um, those of you who know Bill Corrin, Bill Corrin worked a lot on this machine. Not, this is the one in the museum. This is not the Bell Labs one. Um, but of course, it was a piece of furniture because they were showing off. Uh, the interesting thing about the Cray's design is this, if you, this is sort of three quarters open. This is the back plane. And you can't really tell because the picture is kind of low res. But these are all blue wires hanging down here. And things are really hanging. And the signal, trans the signal time for transport had to be adjusted. The, w the wires all had to be adjusted to, you know, to two nanoseconds per foot time of, of, of electricity and copper so that all the signals would arrive simultaneously for an operation. And this was done by adjusting the lengths of the, of the cables in the back plane. And uh, it was all put together by women, because women do this kind of thing better. Um, and there's nice photos you can find of, of women wiring up craze. But it was an, a pretty amazing machine, much, much more powerful than anything we had in the, the VAX space, for example. This was a multi-million dollar computer, and heavy enough that although the, there were 14-inch thick concrete floors at Bell Labs, they had to reinforce them to bring the Cray into the computer center. Um, now, why is that relevant to this? Well, this was a, remember I said you could connect a blit up because it wasn't a standalone workstation. You could plug it in to other machines and let them talk to it, and you could have, multi, you could have graphical editors and circuit design and profit up into the right graphs showing up even though you were talking to a regular old mainframe. And one of those was the Cray, because Dennis Ritchie and Norman Wilson ported Unix to this beast, which was quite an undertaking. It was not a machine that wanted Unix on it. It wasn't byte addressable, for instance. But they did it, and it worked really, really well, and eventually became the main operating system used on the Cray. Because it, you know, the, the operating system was so much nicer to use than the one Cray had built. Um, but they ended up buying them. So this is actually at Cray headquarters. This is a photograph from a book by the photographer Lee Friedlander that was handed out to Cray employees. Probably didn't appreciate it because Friedlander is slightly grim. But uh, notice that. This time the mouse is the right way around. Cray knows how to use the mouse. That's, a, that's the commercial uh, teletype version of the blip called the 5620. And Lee Friedlander took a picture of two people. And I guarantee there's a Cray at the other end of that. It's kind of nice. So that was a big thrill for me. But uh, you know, obviously the world has passed us passed all this by. We're doing different things now. Now the screen and the cray are together, which makes things a little nicer, I guess. Um, another thing that was going on at the time was Dave Ditzel, who I mentioned for having built the Nuke the Smiley's machine. He'd probably be offended that I call it that, but he'd know what I meant. He went on to form, um, oh, what's it called? Not Teradata, Transmeta, Transmeta. Um, and, uh, but he did Transmeta after he designed a machine at Bell Labs called CRISP, the C Reduced Instruction Set Processor, which was a stack-based machine that was interesting. We ported Plan 9 to it. Um, and Bart Locanti, who had designed the Blit, wanted to make graphics uh, really good on the, not, uh, on, the, on the CRISP as well. So he built this machine called BALU. The, uh, uh, it stands for BitBlit ALU or something like that. Uh, it would sit on the bus of the CRISP processor. The CRISP later became the CPU inside the Apple Newton machine. Those of you may remember that. This is not a particularly interesting thing in its right. It didn't work, not because of anything wrong with this chip, but because the CRISP did not do what it said it was going to do on its bus, and so they actually didn't talk properly. But I want to show you this picture. This is probably 87. Uh, there's photos up here. Uh, these are pictures I, I took, and then we reduced using all the software on the blit. Um, this is, you know, here's what it is. Bitmap Assist, it says. That is Jennifer Locanti, Bart's daughter. Uh, that was a baby picture. We are fairly confident this was the smallest baby picture ever done at this time, although the pictures of the principals were actually uh, smaller. Later, you can find, uh, there's a photograph, uh, not a photograph, but a, a plot of another chip done at Bell Labs. Uh, that's in the Museum of Modern Art in New York that has a Peter face on it. 
is much more important. But I, I have the ballot here. You can take a look and see this thing. So I have to tell you about the people there. This was this photograph was made actually for Bill Corrin when he left Bell Labs, to move out west. This is the, the Unix room, not the room that the PDB7 is in, but the one downstairs. Behind this wall is a whole bunch of computers. This was made in 2000. Uh, 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 actually, Rene French, my wife actually made this photo, but I'm back. That's me, uh, Phil Winterbottom. Uh, that's Sean Quinlan, Ray McClellan, Dave Rosado. There's some other, there's Lawrence Holtzberg back here. There's a bunch of other Google people in here. There's most important, I guess, there's Ken hiding, and Dennis is there somewhere I've seen him before. He's there, anyway. These are the people that were in that lab. There's Tom Zmanski. Um, people, it was, it was a very collaborative thing. I know I've told a very solipsistic story, but there was a lot of people working with us and around us and using the things that we built that made all this happen and launched Unix out into the world. And so Unix has become this. This is a graph of all of the Unix versions. And I worked on this bit, which isn't, well, I didn't work on that bit. I worked on this bit, which isn't very much because of all of this other stuff that's happened somewhat in parallel and often since. But if you had told me when I went to Bell Labs in 1980 that I would later work for a company that had one squajillion Unix machines running, I would have not understood what you were talking about. Um, the idea that pretty much the whole modern world runs on this operating system, great on a PDP-7, is a little bit nuts. Um, but uh, eventually, it was the Unix had launched into the world, and so, we must bid the Unix room a fond adieu. And uh, thanks for coming and hearing my little story. Appreciate it. Thank you. So you're welcome to come up later and, and look at some of the props up here. I've got some odds and ends that might interest some of you, as long as you treat them with respect. And questions, I guess, for a couple minutes. People have questions, as long as they're reasonably on topic. Okay, now you can ask questions about anything. Yeah.